Are you ready to dive into the hidden mysteries of the ancient world? From a stargate said to connect with otherworldly beings, to the Egyptians' secret belief in manifesting their desires, and even an ancient society of brilliant minds in India, there's a lot to uncover. So grab a seat, get comfortable, and let's explore these secrets together. The Creek Wind Clan Stargate Long before anyone had ever heard of Star Trek or Stargate, Creek Indian legends told a fascinating story about visitors from another galaxy. Richard L. Thornton, an architect and city planner from Georgia, shared the incredible tales passed down from his great uncles. These weren't your typical bedtime stories. They were about cosmic portals, interstellar visitors, and a mysterious connection between humans and alien beings. According to Thornton's family, the visitors were humanoids, but they were much taller and had bigger brains than humans. They were so similar to us that they could even mate with humans. Imagine bringing an alien home to meet your family. Awkward. The Creek people believed that some of their leaders, particularly the chiefs known as the Great Sons, were descendants of these hybrids. Why? Because they were said to be about seven feet tall. These visitors used what we now call stargates to travel between their galaxy and Earth. And get this, the Creek believed there were three locations in Georgia where these stargates were hidden. According to legend, there was one in Elbert County where the now demolished Georgia Guidestones stood. Another one was at Okmulgee National Historical Park, possibly at the spiral-ramped Lamar Mound within the site. And the third was said to be in the Nakuchi Valley where Thornton lives today. What's even more mind-blowing is that the three Stargate locations form a perfect triangle. Coincidence? I'll let you decide. The Creek Wind Clan, Thornton's clan, was responsible for maintaining these stargates. Some priests and leaders even tried to use them to visit the home galaxy of these tall visitors. But it wasn't all spacefaring fun and games. There were many risks involved. Some travelers never returned, and others came back in terrifying conditions, mangled or even transformed into amorphous blobs. However, those who survived spoke of seeing spiral galaxies and endless stars, visions that sound strangely familiar to what modern astronomers describe today. So maybe there's some truth to these stories. Now, here's where it starts to get really weird. Back in 1733, European astronomers had just started to observe fuzzy galaxies through their telescopes. They hadn't yet figured out that the Milky Way was part of a spiral galaxy. Meanwhile, Creek priests and leaders were casually explaining that there were many Earth-like planets and spiral galaxies in the universe. But how could they have possibly known that? Even early Georgian settlers were confused by how advanced Creek land surveyors were. After all, they used trigonometry long before it was common knowledge in Europe. Thornton's story may sound like the plot of a science fiction novel, but the legends have been around for centuries. So what do you think? Could these Creek stargates be real, or are they just a stuff of myth? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. Melting Stone with Plants have you ever seen an ancient stone structure and thought to yourself, how in the world did people carve this out? Well, what if I told you that the answer was plants? Listen to this and let me know what you think about this theory in the comments. Some of these ancient constructions are made of stone that ranks high on the Mohs hardness scale, with some reaching levels of 8 or 9. To put that into perspective, diamonds are at a 10. You'd expect the ancient stonemasons used iron or steel tools. But mysteriously, they didn't have those tools available when many of these incredible structures were built. So what gives? Many of the stone monuments we marvel at today were made long before iron was even a thing. So how did they manage to craft such precise, intricate designs on stones like diorite, granite, and andesite? These rocks are known for their exceptional strength and resilience, far surpassing the durability of most other stones. Take Puma Punku in Bolivia, for example. The stones at this site fit together with millimeter precision, like a jigsaw puzzle made by some incredibly skilled stonemasons. Or the massive Olmec heads in Mexico carved from tough basalt, each weighing tons. And then there's the Serapium of Saqqara in Egypt, where enormous granite sarcophagi were hollowed out with their interiors just as smooth as the exteriors. How did they manage all this without advanced tools? Naturally, these mind-boggling feats have led to all sorts of wild theories. 
Aliens with laser beams, anyone? Some think ancient people used advanced machinery we have yet to discover, while others suggest they had help from an unknown advanced civilization. But the truth might not be quite that dramatic, though it's fun to imagine space creatures lending a hand in these projects. Instead, a more down-to-earth explanation might lie in ancient chemistry. Some researchers propose that ancient stonemasons may have used natural acids to dissolve and shape the stone. This would make sense because acids like hydrofluoric acid, which is highly corrosive and can melt siliceous rocks, do exist in nature. So rather than chiseling away with tools, they might have melted the stone away little by little. In ancient legends, there are mysterious substances described as being able to weaken or destroy stone. The Bible even mentions something called shamir, a tool or substance Moses used to carve the Ten Commandments. According to these tales, Shamir could cut through the hardest stone without leaving a single scratch, which sounds an awful lot like the effects of hydrofluoric acid. And here's another cool detail. Ancient workers supposedly had to store Shamir in a lead container because it was so reactive. That's exactly how you'd handle hydrofluoric acid today. But what about the plants? Over in Peru, legends tell of a plant called pito which could melt stone. In fact, an explorer once reported seeing this plant's extract dissolve rock right before his eyes. And in both Jewish and Peruvian myths, there's even talk of birds that use these magical substances to soften stone for nest building. I know it sounds like a fairy tale, but these stories are surprisingly similar for cultures that were so far apart geographically. So could ancient people have really been using some form of natural acid to craft these impressive stone structures? It's possible. This method would have allowed them to shape stones with ease, saving tons of time and effort. Instead of hammering away at a block of granite with tools, they could have just applied some acid and let it do the hard work for them. This technique would not leave behind any tool marks, which is exactly what we see on many of these ancient artifacts. The acid would simply dissolve the stone at an atomic level, creating those ultra-smooth surfaces we find so fascinating today. Of course, there's still a lot of mystery here. Like, how did they figure out which plants or materials could produce such powerful acids? Why didn't they pass this knowledge down through the generations? And if they did use acids, why don't we see more direct evidence of it? While we may never fully understand how these ancient stonemasons worked their magic, it's clear that they were way ahead of their time. Whether they were wielding mysterious acids, using tools lost to history, or had a secret technique we have yet to discover, these ancient workers definitely knew their stuff. And now for a quick break. But first, I wanted to give a shout out and big thank you to Jeremiah McElhaney and Adam Daly for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos like this. Adam's first wife. Was Eve really the first woman ever created? It might surprise you to know that not everyone believes this. So if not Eve, who came first? Well, according to some, it was Lilith, one of the most mysterious and misunderstood figures in folklore. But who exactly was Lilith? There's two possibilities here. She was either a demonic villain or the first feminist fighting for her independence. There's no in-between. Lilith's story first appeared in ancient Babylonian texts, where she was described as a winged female demon who attacked pregnant women and babies. Okay, not off to a great start. But as the legend spread to places like Israel, Greece, and Egypt, Lilith's identity started to evolve. By the time the Middle Ages rolled around, Jewish sources introduced a whole new version of Lilith, Adam's bold and rebellious first wife. Yes, that Adam, Eve's husband. But before Eve, there was Lilith. So how did Lilith go from being a demoness to Adam's first wife? To understand that, we need to look at the Bible. The creation of humans is described twice. In Genesis 1, God creates both man and woman at the same time. But in Genesis 2, God creates man from dust and then woman from man's side. Some scholars argued that these two different creation stories meant there were two different women, Eve being the second and Lilith the mysterious first. The story only gets more interesting from here. According to a medieval text called the Alphabet of Ben Sirah, Lilith and Adam didn't exactly get along. Why? Because Adam always wanted to be in charge, and Lilith refused to cooperate. She wanted equality, and when Adam protested, she left the Garden of Eden by pronouncing her secret name of God and flying off into the air. 
Talk about a dramatic exit. I mean, who knew she could fly? God then sent three angels to bring Lilith back, but she stood her ground, refusing to return to a life of submission. Instead, she declared that she would roam the world, causing sickness to infants, especially male babies. However, she made a deal with the angels. If she saw their names on an amulet, she would leave that child alone. In a strange twist, Lilith also agreed that 100 of her demon children would die every day. Makes you wonder how many demons she created on a daily basis. Despite this agreement, though, she remained fiercely defiant about her freedom. But here's the million dollar question. Was Lilith really evil or was she just standing up for herself? Some see her as a symbol of female empowerment, the first woman to say, I'm not going to settle for less. Others paint her as a dangerous demoness bent on destruction. Maybe she was both, misunderstood and feared, a woman who wouldn't conform to a world that demanded she submit. There's a legend that says Lilith is still out there wandering the earth. Could that be true? Could she still be alive today, popping out demon babies somewhere? Or is the whole idea of her existence nothing but a myth? Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below. The Royal Game of Ur How would you like to play the oldest board game in the world? For nearly 5,000 years, the Royal Game of Ur was lost to history, like an ancient secret waiting to be uncovered. This game, once loved in the bustling Sumerian civilization of Mesopotamia, quietly faded away as new games took its place. But in the 1920s, archaeologists made a thrilling discovery that would bring this forgotten game back into the spotlight. Picture this, it's 1928 and British archaeologist Sir Leonard Woolley is digging through the ruins of Ur, an ancient city in modern-day Iraq. His team is searching for treasures and they find something incredible. Five beautifully decorated wooden game boards covered in inlaid shell and lapis lazuli. These boards were like ancient pieces of art, but there was a problem. Nobody knew how to play the mysterious game. Before we dive into the game itself though, let's talk about the city of Ur. This ancient metropolis, once located near the Persian Gulf, was a major hub of Sumerian culture thousands of years ago. Over time, the coastline shifted, leaving Ur stranded in land. In the 1920s and 1930s, Woolley led an expedition that unearthed the city's buried secrets, including royal tombs, artifacts, and yes, the royal game of Ur. One of his most famous finds was Queen Poabi's tomb, which was full of treasures. But for us, the real treasure was the game that helped reveal the social life of the Sumerians. Fast forward to the 1980s, when the mystery of how to play the game was finally solved by a man named Irving Finkel. Finkel was a curator at the British Museum who stumbled upon a clay tablet from the 2nd century BC written by a Babylonian scribe. This tablet contained the rules to the royal game of Ur. Can you imagine finding an ancient instruction manual after 5,000 years? The game was a race where players would roll pyramid-shaped dice to move their pieces around the board. But it wasn't just about luck. Strategy played a key role. You could bump your opponent's pieces back to the start just to rub salt in the wound, kind of like the game Sorry we have today. But things got more mystical when the tablet revealed that the game wasn't just for fun. It had a deeper meaning. The squares a player landed on were tied to predictions about their fortune. Anything from food and drink to friendships and wealth, this was a real game of fate. The Royal Game of Ur is now available to play online. Thanks to people like Woolly and Fink, this ancient pastime has been resurrected for the modern world. The Mystery of the Roman Tunnels of Baie In ancient Rome, Baie was the ultimate vacation spot for the rich and famous. This was a seaside resort in southern Italy, known for its luxurious lifestyle and hot springs. You can think of it as the ancient version of a celebrity hangout, but with a mysterious twist. Over the centuries, volcanic activity submerged much of Baie underwater, turning its ruins into an underwater archaeological wonderland. But as cool as that sounds, Baie wasn't just about luxury, it had a deep connection to mythology. The real mystery began in 1932, when Italian archaeologist Amadeo Maiori stumbled upon a hidden chamber, or antrum, beneath the ground. But oddly enough, he and his team didn't look much into it, and left the discovery alone. In fact, it was largely ignored until the 1960s when British amateur archaeologist Robert Paget stepped in to explore its potential. 
He and his team spent a decade exploring what they uncovered, a complex system of tunnels. These tunnels, according to Paget, weren't just random Roman construction. Nope, they might have been the legendary Cave of the Sibyl. Who was the Sibyl, you might be asking? Well, legend has it that she was a prophetess named Amalthea, living in a cave nearby. She could supposedly predict the future, writing her prophecies on oak leaves. In one famous story, she offered King Tarquin the proud nine books of prophecy for a ridiculously high price. When he refused to pay up, she burned three of them and offered the remaining six for the same price. The king refused again, and she burned three more books. Finally, with just three books left, he caved and bought them at the original asking price for nine. These books, filled with prophecies, were said to be consulted by the Romans during times of crisis. But now back to the tunnels. Paget believed they were designed to mirror a journey to the underworld like something out of Greek mythology. The tunnels were complete with an underground stream, possibly representing the river Styx, where souls had to cross into Hades. Paget even found what looked like a boat landing, and at the end of the stream was a staircase leading to a hidden sanctuary. Paget speculated that someone may have impersonated the Sibyl here, performing rituals for the Romans. Paget's theory is still debated, though. No one really knows who built the tunnels or when they were created. And as for what they were truly used for, it's anyone's guess. Let me know yours down below. The Stolen City who built Teotihuacan, the ancient city that once dominated Mesoamerica? The Aztecs lived here at one point, so you would think they were responsible, but that's not the case. The truth is, the Aztecs stumbled upon this place and simply used it as their own. So the builders of Teotihuacan remain one of history's greatest unsolved puzzles. A long time ago, just outside modern-day Mexico City, there stood a massive ancient city called Teotihuacan. It had giant pyramids rising hundreds of feet into the air, towering over ceremonial grounds and ruins that once belonged to one of the most powerful cities in all of Mesoamerica. The pyramids, especially the Pyramid of the Sun and the Pyramid of the Moon, are truly awe-inspiring. Teotihuacan was a busy city, full of life. This place was like an ancient version of New York City, but with stone apartments, temples, and a vibrant mix of people from all over. At its peak, Teotihuacan was home to over 100,000 people, making it one of the largest cities in the world at the time. Teotihuacan was planned with precision. The city is laid out in perfect geometry with irrigation canals and ceremonial plazas. This wasn't just a place for living, it was the hub of culture, politics, and power in the region. It was a place of wealth, with influence spreading far and wide across Mesoamerica. But here's the twist. Despite its impressive size and complexity, the identity of Teotihuacan's builders remains one of the most enduring mysteries in Mesoamerican archaeology. That's right, the identity of Teotihuacan's builders is one of Mexico's biggest mysteries. We don't even know what language they spoke or exactly how the city was governed. For a city that held so much power, it sure has a way of keeping its secrets. Teotihuacan first started to rise over 2,000 years ago, and by the second century AD, it had grown into a flourishing city. Its temples, including the massive pyramids, were likely used for religious rituals. Recent discoveries have shown that people offered valuable items like obsidian, textiles, and even human sacrifices to their gods. Imagine standing near the Pyramid of the Moon, knowing there might be treasures and bodies buried inside. It's both creepy and fascinating. The city thrived until about 700 AD, and then something mysterious happened. Maybe there was a drought, famine, or warfare, but for whatever reason, people abandoned the city. But even after it was deserted, Teotihuacan was still seen as a magnificent sacred place. The Aztecs, who came along much later, believed it was where the gods themselves were created, and they even performed their own rituals there. The name Teotihuacan comes from the Aztec language, and it means the place where gods were born. Talk about giving a place an epic name. But who were the Teotihuacan people, and where did they come from? Some think they were a mix of different groups coming together after a natural disaster. Who knows, maybe a volcanic eruption forced them to unite and build this great city. Others suggest they might have been the Totonacs or even the Toltecs. However, the Toltecs likely didn't arrive on the scene until after Teotihuacan had already declined. 
One of the reasons it's so hard to figure out who built Teotihuacan is because they didn't leave behind much in terms of writing. Unlike the Maya, who carved their history into stone and left behind a treasure trove of inscriptions, the Teotihuacan people didn't have a formal written language. This makes it tough for archaeologists to piece together their story. Even the government structure of Teotihuacan is a mystery. Unlike the Maya or the Aztecs, who had clear rulers and kings, Teotihuacan doesn't have any signs of a central ruler. So was the city run by a council, or maybe a group of leaders? No one knows for sure. But guess what? The story doesn't end there. In 2003, after a heavy rainstorm, a sinkhole opened up near the Temple of the Plumed Serpent. Archaeologists, who were always up for a good mystery, went down into the sinkhole and discovered a secret tunnel under the plaza. Inside, they found all kinds of offerings, seashells, cat bones, pottery, and even fragments of human skin. The finds suggest that there's still so much more to learn about Teotihuacan. Maybe one day we'll uncover the final clues that reveal who really built this magnificent city. Do you have any guesses? Let me hear them in the comments. The Art of Manifestation What if you could simply draw something that you wanted and it would poof into existence? How incredible would that be? Sadly, that's just not how things work. But try and tell that to the ancient Egyptians. They would laugh in your face. That's right. In ancient Egypt, art wasn't just about making pretty pictures or sculptures. It was a way to create reality. The Egyptians didn't even have a word for art as we understand it today. Instead, everything they made from tomb paintings to statues had a specific purpose. And get this, it wasn't just decoration. They believed that by creating something, they were literally bringing it into existence. Sounds like magic, right? Well, for them, it kinda was. Egyptian art was full of ideas idealized human forms. You've likely seen those statues and paintings of pharaohs looking perfect with everything in just the right place. But those weren't just portraits, they were designed to manifest a pharaoh's eternal power. That's how important art was. It wasn't about showing things how they were, but how they should be, especially in the afterlife. Now, here's where it gets even more fascinating. The Egyptians thought that the images and statues they created in tombs and temples would serve a real functional purpose in the afterlife. For example, the Shaptis. These little figurines were placed in tombs to act as servants for the deceased. These weren't just decorations. The Egyptians believed that these figures would come to life in the afterworld and do the work for the person who had passed. Imagine having magical workers ready to serve you in the next life. It wasn't just about servants. The walls of tombs were covered in detailed scenes showing offerings, prayers, and even dangerous creatures like snakes and crocodiles. The Egyptians believed these images would help guide the deceased through the underworld, or duet, which was full of tricky obstacles and monsters. To keep things safe, dangerous animals were drawn cut in half. Why? Because, obviously, you don't want a giant snake you just painted to suddenly come to life and attack you in the afterlife. One of the most famous pieces of Egyptian art with a practical purpose is King Tut's sandals. They were decorated with images of his enemies, so every time he took a step, he was symbolically crushing them. How awesome is that? Egyptians also used art in their temples for divine purposes. Statues of gods called Necher were more than just idols. They were thought to be literal homes for the gods. Priests would care for these statues as if they were living beings, dressing and feeding them daily. The belief was that by tending to these statues, the gods would manifest and protect the people. So why did they believe in this art as reality idea? Well, it all ties back to their need for order, or ma'at. For Egyptians, maintaining balance and harmony in the universe was crucial, and their art played a big part in this. They believed that creating images, symbols, and statues in just the right way helped keep the world in balance and protected them in both life and death. In a way, this idea of manifesting reality through art is still with us today. People believe in the power of vision boards, affirmations, and other practices meant to bring desires to life. Maybe it's not quite the same as drawing a snake and worrying it'll come to life, but the core belief that thoughts, images, and actions can shape reality is still around. The Egyptians didn't separate art, religion, and magic. They saw them as interconnected. Their entire belief system was rooted in the idea that what they created would impact their world, whether in this life or the next. Why they believed this is a bit of a mystery. Did they see something come to life before their very eyes? Did one of their manifested gods show themselves and perform a miracle? 
What do you think? The Nine Unknown Men A secret society known as the Nine Unknown Men formed in India over 2,000 years ago. At least, that's what the legends say. This group supposedly holds the keys to all the world's scientific knowledge. This story is linked to real history, and it all starts with a famous emperor named Ashoka. Ashoka, the grandson of Chandra Gupta, the guy who unified India, became emperor in 269 BC. After a brutal war in the Kalinga region where hundreds of thousands of people were killed or displaced, Ashoka was so horrified by the bloodshed that he vowed to never use violence again. This transformation led him to convert to Buddhism and dedicate his life to peace. He wanted to ensure that no one used knowledge for evil, especially especially when it came to war. So here's where the nine unknown men come in. Ashoka supposedly gathered nine of the brightest minds in India and tasked them with a secret mission. They were told to collect, preserve, and guard all knowledge, particularly anything that could be used destructively. And here's the catch. No one could know who these men were. Their identities were kept top secret, which is why they're called the nine unknown men. Each of these men was responsible for one book of knowledge, covering everything from science to sociology. Theology. These books were updated through the ages and passed down to a new member when one of the nine stepped down or died. So the society always had exactly nine members, each guarding knowledge that could change the world. I know what you're thinking. What did these mysterious books contain? Well, according to legend, they covered topics like propaganda, manipulating public opinion, as well as physiology, including the mythical touch of death. Subjects like microbiology, alchemy, communication, with aliens apparently, gravity, how to build ancient flying machines, and more could also be found in the books. There was even a book on light, supposedly detailing how to use it as a weapon. But were these nine unknown men real? Well, that's the big question. Some believe Ashoka did gather secret knowledge, especially related to warfare, and that these men might have been responsible for studying and improving battle strategies. But the idea that this group has existed in secrecy for over 2,000 years, without leaving any solid trace, makes it sound more like legend than fact. Could a group of ancient scholars really be controlling world events from the jungles of India without modern technology or infrastructure? It's hard to say. It's not likely, but it's not impossible either. What do you think? The Biblical Amalek People The Amalekites, one of the great mysteries of the Bible, have long been the subject of debate for scholars, historians, and even political leaders. But who were they? Were they even real? Or are they a symbol of something darker and more obscure? In the Bible, the Amalekites are described as fierce enemies of the Israelites. They're first mentioned in Genesis. However, they pop up most famously in the book of Exodus, where they ambushed the Israelites as they journeyed toward the Promised Land. But this wasn't just an ordinary battle. As the story goes, Moses stood on a hill with his arms raised, holding the staff of God. As long as his hands were up, the Israelites won. When he grew tired and let them fall, the Amalekites started to prevail. So two men, Aaron and Hur, helped him keep his arms up, leading to the defeat of the Amalekites. How long could you keep your arms in the air if that was the only way to save your family? This wasn't the end of their story, though. The Amalekites continued to be a thorn in the side of the Israelites for years. In one instance, they raided the town of Ziklag, which led to King David launching a successful attack to recover everything that had been stolen. Then comes the most famous tale about them, the one involving Saul in the book of Samuel. God commanded Saul to utterly destroy the Amalekites as punishment for their long-standing hostility. That meant wiping out everything – men, women, children, even their animals. But Saul didn't follow orders. He spared the Amalekite king, Agag, and kept some of the best livestock. As a result, Saul was scolded by the prophet Samuel and lost his throne. Later, during the Jewish festival of Purim, the villain Haman, who plotted to wipe out the Jews in Persia, was said to be a descendant of Agag. And in the eyes of the Bible, this was no coincidence. But there's more to the Amalek mystery. Some ancient texts like the Midrash, Jewish commentaries, suggest the Amalekites were practitioners of magic and the occult. They're portrayed not just as physical enemies, but as spiritual ones too, symbolizing all the forces of evil that oppose God and goodness. Some even believe this is why they were targeted so harshly in the Bible. The Burrito Sarcophagus 
Imagine stumbling upon a centuries-old mystery buried underground. That's exactly what happened near Rome, where archaeologists uncovered a bizarre lead sarcophagus that had been sealed for 1,700 years. The ancient coffin found in the once-thriving city of Gabi has fascinated scientists because of its strange design. It's not your typical rectangular shape. Nope. It's folded over like a giant burrito. Gabi, a city that thrived alongside Rome for hundreds of years, was a bustling metropolis. But by the 2nd or 3rd century AD, it began to decline, eventually becoming abandoned. Today, the city is mostly forgotten except by archaeologists who have been digging up its secrets. One of the most surprising discoveries during these digs was the lead sarcophagus unearthed in 2009. Lead coffins are rare, with only a few hundred known from Roman times, making this find something extraordinary. The fact that it was made of lead suggests that the person buried inside was someone important. Someone of substance, as the archaeologists put it. But who could it be? That's the big question. The coffin did not contain any grave goods, the usual items buried with the dead like jewelry or tools. So the archaeologists were puzzled. Was it a soldier, a high-ranking church official, or maybe even a female gladiator? Lead coffins have been known to hold all sorts of important figures, including women and adolescents. One theory suggests that the body inside could be that of a Christian dignitary, but without more evidence, it's hard to say for sure. And to add to the mystery, the coffin was buried right in the middle of a city block, which is highly unusual since Romans had strict rules against burying the dead within city limits. The archaeologists want to know more about the person inside, but cracking open the coffin isn't that simple. Lead coffins are tough to study because X-rays and CT scans, which are normally used to peek inside, can't penetrate the thick lead. And there's an added danger. Opening the coffin might release toxic lead dust that could harm the researchers. To avoid this, they're considering using tiny fiber-optic cameras to look inside without disturbing the contents. One clue they've already found is a small foot bone sticking out of a hole in the coffin. The bone is in surprisingly good condition, hinting that the rest of the body might be well-preserved too. If they can safely examine the skeleton, the scientists hope to learn more about the person's life, maybe even what they ate, what illnesses they had, or how they lived. To this day, the coffin has never been opened. So who was this mysterious person wrapped in lead? Was their burial a sign of wealth, power, or perhaps even a special religious status? Nobody can say for sure. But the answer could unlock new secrets about Gabi and offer a peek into the forgotten history of ancient Rome. Which one of these lost secrets from the ancient world stood out to you the most? Let me know in the comments. And while you're at it, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.